couple things uh, I'd like to highlight. First of all, if you're not picked up on something, we're going to talk a little bit about spring cleaning today. And Kevin really has, in his song, captured the first scripture text. The first scripture text is from Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah. And Isaiah says to us in the first chapter, the 16th verse, he says, go home and wash up. Clean up your act. Sweep your lives clean of your evil doings so I don't have to look at them any longer. Say no to wrong. Learn to do good. Work for justice. Help the down and out. Stand up for the homeless. Go to bat for the defenseless. You know, I think what Isaiah is saying here is we got to clean up things at home so we can get to work doing what God has given us life, breath, and movement to do. He's very clear, clean it up, get it together, so you can go forth and do this. I don't know how many of you yesterday used that kind of beautiful day to do something amazing. I did, didn't I, Katie? I did something amazing. I have witnesses. I cleaned out my garage yesterday. Yeah, I did. Well, actually, Katie and Susan were amazing. They gave me about, it is a miracle, gave me about 45 minutes where Andrew got to clean out the garage and I got to chat with my neighbors. But overall, we spent the day cleaning out the garage. And you know how that works? You pull everything out that has accumulated over the winter. Um, Becky, that's what you do, that's how it works. You pull everything out that has accumulated over winter and then you kind of go through it, you look at it, you look at what you think you need and then you toss out the rest. You know, Jesus knew that we'd all have garages full of stuff someday. I'm, I know, he, I know. Sounds crazy, but he did. He did. And he leaves us a parable about filling up our garages. It goes just like this. It's from Luke 12, he says. And he told him this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I will store my surplus grain. And then I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take it easy, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded for you, from you. Then you will get what you have prepared for yourself. Then will you get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be for whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich towards God. A couple things I want to highlight here. It's all about him. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. Now, you'll be happy to know, especially my friends who have recently retired, I don't believe Jesus is saying here, you know, don't prepare for retirement. I think what he's saying is, be careful that it's not all about you, but indeed your life is such that your life is a reflection of your relationship with God. I believe that's what he's saying here. So, so uh, I've been back for a few weeks now, and I've given you a little bit of time. Um, so now you get to see pictures of my vacation. It's true. Okay, so Andrew and I went thousands and thousands of miles to Thailand and to Singapore and to Cambodia not long ago. And it, my friends, was an amazing, life-changing experience. First of all, we got to explore Buddhism, which I really thought I knew something about, but I don't really, I'm not as versed in Buddhism as I thought I was. But to be immersed in that culture and to, to hang out in the midst of the Thai culture, where Buddhism is, by the way, 95% of the culture are, refer to themselves as Buddhists. So that was pretty amazing. We were there during this thing con called Songkran, Songkran, Songkran is the Thai New Year, and it's really a time where people just essentially throw water all over each other. I'm not kidding. They throw water all over each other as a reminder of being renewed and uh, essentially kind of being baptized. One of the actions that you participate in is you will find these different uh, Buddha statues around, and they'll have waters and cups of water, and you're encouraged to pour water on the Buddha and seek Buddha's blessing and to clean your life and to make you new. It was a neat experience.
Another really phenomenal experience that Andrew and I had was we had an opportunity to meet with an abbot, an abbot who is the president of a seminary or a school and also the abbot of a Watt. And we brought him a little love from Indianapolis, get it, the love sculpture, and a little book about the author there. And we were able to spend a day with him talking about, or actually about three hours, talking to him about what it means to share in community. You know, Buddhism is kind of a, a lonely existence for monks, some would say. But they have found a way to share in community together. And he is a, an amazing man who is finding ways to create community in Bangkok. So it's pretty amazing to me, this experience we had. But what's even more amazing to me about this experience we had? We did it all with two suitcases. <laughs> yep, just two suitcases, those suitcases or ones very much like it. We were able to travel all that way with just a couple of suitcases, and I have to admit that there were days where it felt like I had too much, you know, when you have to drag them around and, and drag all your stuff around. There were days when I thought, that is just too much. But we did it, and it was amazing, and we survived amazingly well, unencumbered by a lot of stuff, all of our stuff at home. Now, I always thought that we were doing pretty good as ministers and we were doing great. But then I learned this while we were in Thailand, that a monk does not get two suitcases. In fact, a monk doesn't get much at all. What a Buddhist monk gets are three robes, one to wear, one that's sturdy, and one for repair. A girdle, that's the thing that they wrap around themselves an alms bowl, the other bowl is a bowl for food, they also have a needle for fixing, and a razor to shave their head. Now, these are the basic needs that have been determined for a monk or someone who is sharing the love of Buddha with others. It has been determined that that is all they need. And in Thailand, you actually do see a number of monks out. Why? Because 95% of the culture is Buddhist. And um, also, as a monk, most men before the age of 20 somehow go into the order, whether or not you're going to stay in the order or not. Most every man it has that experience, not the girls. We'll talk about that later. Um, but uh, so what's interesting is you will often see monks with their alms bowl, walking around, seeking gifts for the Wat or the temple. You'll often see them seeking something to eat. And what's amazing is people respond because it's a cycle of karma. They all believe it's a cycle of karma that indeed if they don't give, that God won't give to them that if they don't care for the Buddhist, the Buddhist or the, Bo or the monk, the monk won't care for them. And it's just this incredible cycle that tends to work pretty well. I never saw anybody with a sign that says, we'll work for food. I never saw anybody that way. But I did see monks seeking some kind of support for themselves, for the what they serve. Now, let me make it perfectly clear the monk that we hung out with did have a cell phone, did text with us, did those kind of things. Actually, his assistant did, he did not. But there are different levels of how this experience works. But in general, it's very little what they have and how they live. I think witnessing that changed me somehow. I came home and I thought to myself, if I could only have four things, what would they be? If you could only have four things, what would they be? How could you have so little possessions to reflect really who you are and whose you are? I have to be honest, I haven't quite figured it out yet. I'm not into the minister crawler thing. I, I, maybe my phone, cause, but that's probably not right either. What four things would I take? The Bible, my love for Jesus, I don't know. But what I do know is there are some things that are already happening here at the garden. I don't know exactly what we would carry with us, but I do know that we have a willingness to care for one another. 
We have planted the Crooked Creek uh, Gardens Gardens, and they're getting ready to grow, and they're getting ready to produce. And we get to be present with people, and I encourage you to do this at least once, to deliver that produce and engage with the people who will receive those offerings, who will receive those alms. Something else I've come to realize is indeed I am blessed to live in a country and to serve a God who sees that I have the same rights and responsibilities as any male, that I have the same rights and responsibilities and the ability to share the love of God as a female. Never really realized that until I walked into another culture where I was encouraged to step a little bit behind, where I was encouraged to let the men talk. So thank you. Thank you for allowing me to serve as your pastor because this is what God has called me to do. And I'm not going to stop anytime soon. And I have to be honest that I may have even encouraged a few of those Thai women that maybe they need to think a little bit about speaking up a little more and just kind of walking side by side, if that's okay. It was very interesting to walk into a different tradition where you don't have the same rights and responsibilities. It's given me a new understanding for people in this, this country who don't have, a, have what they need to stay in this country, that don't have the same uh, color skin as I do and may not be invited into the same places. It's given me a new understanding and a desire to understand even more. I think that experience and coming home to my big house has led me to share in the spring cleaning message in a different way today. Because I think that sometimes in this country, we try to identify with what we have rather than who we are and whose we are. That we try to identify ourselves by the car we drive and by the houses we have and by what stuff is in that house. Particularly for us baby boomers. You know, we were raised by people who didn't have much at all. And so their desire to make us whole people, they encouraged us and they gave us what we wanted and what we needed. And now we fill our houses with those things that we don't necessarily need. We fill our garages with those things that we don't necessarily need. I think what Jesus is saying here is take a look at your possessions and be mindful if your possessions own you or if you own your possessions. There's a really neat movement happening in our world today. Do you realize that in the last 50 years, we now have three times the amount of space in our homes that they had 50 years ago? But do you also realize, not only that, but we have $22 billion and 2.2 billion square feet of places called storage bins that hold our stuff. Isn't that amazing? So we have more room in our homes and we have more stuff. We have so much stuff, we can't even keep it all in our homes. Now what else is very interesting is that you would think that we would be some pretty happy people, right? The truth is, is that the happiness levels in the last 50 years have flattened out. They have totally flattened out. We are not happier people because we have more stuff. Meet a guy named Grand Hill. He is an entrepreneur, a designer, and an environmentalist who notes that this way of living is not going to be sustainable for our world. So he has created a, a thing called Life Edited. And he says, and this is what he says, he is called to evangelize the idea that living a pared down life will make you happier, healthier, and wealthier. That it is important for us to edit down our lives, not only for ourselves, but for the world, for the environment. He says, living within our means is financially and environmentally good. Having an unorganized life full of crap is not a recipe for happiness. Kind of interesting, isn't it? Now, he's doing this in a very particular way, and it is so cool that I can't explain it. I want you to see what he has done. Hey, I'm Graham Hill, founder of Tree Hugger and Life Edited. 
At Life Edited, our premise is simple. We think we can apply smart design and technology to create compelling, fulfilling lives that allow you to live within your means, both financially and environmentally. We're going to be building Life Edited apartment buildings across the U.S., and I'm currently living in the Manhattan prototype, so I'd love to take you on a quick tour. We think that you can live large in small spaces. So come on. Over a thousand square feet of functionality and only 420 square feet. One generously sized room that does it all. A productive home office with sit down or stand up desk. Comfortably seat 10 for dinner. A big couch and a big projector. Sleeps two guests comfortably. Interested in this way of life, or perhaps buying, renting, or even investing in a building like this? Sign up for our waiting list and or newsletter at lifeedited.com. Thanks. This way of living is going bangbusters like crazy. There are people waiting in line to be part of this kind of movement. In fact, his latest place is in Maui. Sounds kind of exciting to me, doesn't it? Isn't it amazing how when you put your mind around something, how indeed God will go to work with you in some way or another? I mean, he says he's an evangelist, and I believe it. I believe that he believes this is what he's been made to do. And what's interesting to me is in this amount of space, what is central to the idea? Central to the idea is not necessarily work, but creating a space where you can have 10 people for dinner in 400 square feet. Or you can have your friends over to watch a movie. He is creating a whole new environment for the kids that are going to be coming after us. And I think that he gets the parable that we shared in, in a new and an amazing and in a different way that maybe we can learn from as well. As I said at the beginning of this message, and I, I still believe it, is that I don't think Jesus is saying to us, you can't have stuff. I think what he's saying is be mindful of your stuff. Be mindful of what your stuff says about you and your relationship with God. Be mindful of how your stuff helps you connect with others in giving to the poor, helping the defenseless, helping those in need. I think that's really what he's saying. I know, and I've, because I've had conversations with many of you, that this is the time in your life when you're downsizing, you don't want to work in your yards anymore. I think that's great. That's why I think this message is ideal for right now. What will you want to take with you? What is gonna be important to you? I know there are other people here who have gotten uh, motor homes and plan to travel in a different way. I'll be excited to see what moving and being in that space does not only for your own life, but what it says about your relationship with God. Friends, this season is the perfect time to examine what we have, why we have it, and where it leads us. It may be that you are ready to get rid of some things. It may be that you uh, find that now is the time to downsize, or maybe even you want to upside. I think what Jesus is saying is it's important to be mindful of what we have, what it says about us, and what it says about our love for God. Will you pray with me? God of grace and love, to you we give thanks for all the gifts you bestow upon us. We give you thanks that you have given us minds to really think about what it means to be in relationship with you and how our lives reflect that relationship. Be with us as we continue on this spring cleaning journey. Help us indeed to live a life that is totally reflective of your love for us. Amen. Oh. 
Ah. Yeah. 